Those of you who are familiar with ecology are probably also familiar with the concept of a niche or the role an organism fills within its ecosystem. These include top predator, filter feeder, shrub, grazer, decomposer, tree, etc. When looking at this through the perspective of evolutionary biology, we often see distantly related organisms evolving similar features to occupy the same niche in different ecosystems. This is known as convergent evolution. In the field of paleontology, we often see different species occupying the same niche at different time periods and a recurring pattern emerges. An organism fills a niche, the organism goes extinct, either individually or as part of a mass extinction event, the niche is left vacant, another organism evolves to occupy the open niche, and the cycle repeats. But here's a question which can throw a monkey wrench into this structurally static view. Can a niche itself become extinct? In the modern oceans, virtually all free-swimming or nectonic animals are soft-bodied, most notably fish and squid. However, this wasn't always the case. The first nectonic animals were jellyfish which appeared at the end of the Proterozoic some 560 million years ago. Then, during the Cambrian explosion 30 million years later, we see many nectonic animals with a rigid shell appear. Most of these were arthropods and their close relatives such as Opabinia and the fearsome Anomalocaris. A mass extinction at the end of the Cambrian period saw many of these early pioneers go extinct. The subsequent Ordovician period saw the Ordovician biodiversification event, where new, more familiar species evolved to fill the empty niches. The shelled nectonic niche was dominated by the straight nautiloids, but they shared this niche with the Eurypterids, also known as the sea scorpions, and feathery free-swimming trilobites. Although, the extent to which the Eurypterids could be said to be occupying this niche is somewhat debatable, because many had adaptations for both benthic and nectonic locomotion. The end of the Ordovician period saw the first of the five great mass extinction events of Earth's history. The nectonic trilobites were wiped out, while the nautiloids took a heavy hit. The Eurypterids were the least affected, and thus dominated the subsequent Silurian period. This period also saw the rapid diversification of jawless fish, although the extent to which they could be said to be filling the shell nectonic niche would again be a gray area, but because they had varying amounts of armor plating. In the Devonian, we see the Eurypterids being gradually replaced by the armored placoderms, which included the terrifying Dunkleosteus. The Devonian also saw the emergence of the more familiar coil-shelled nautiloids and another group of cephalopods known as the Ammonites. Mass extinctions during the late and end of the Devonian saw the demise of the placoderms and virtually all the marine Eurypterids. Over the course of the Carboniferous and Permian periods, the coiled nautiloids and ammonites continued to gradually diversify, with the nautiloids being more abundant. But at the end of the Permian period, the most devastating mass extinction struck the Earth, which saw the demise of 90% of all species alive at the time. Both nautiloids and ammonites survived, and when the oceans recovered in the mid-Triassic, the ammonites diversified rapidly into many different species. Mass extinctions occurred at the end of the Triassic and Jurassic period, and each time the Ammonites took a hit but recovered quickly in the early Jurassic and Cretaceous. Meanwhile, there were only a few species of nautiloids at a given time, and the end Triassic extinction saw the end of the straight-shelled nautiloids. Then, an asteroid hit the Earth, causing the KT event, the fifth great mass extinction 65 million years ago. The Ammonites were wiped out. But in the Paleocene, the nautiloids diversified to fill the niches left over and flourished throughout the Paleogene. Okay, so far we've seen the same familiar pattern we see elsewhere. Organism fills niche, organism goes extinct, niche is left open, new organism evolves to fill the niche, and the cycle repeats. But 30 million years ago, nautiloids underwent a mysterious decline. One ocean after another saw the nautiloids disappear. By 20 million years ago, only two genera remained. One was the current one, Nautilus, which lived in the tropical Indo-Pacific region as it does now. The other was Aturia, which had a cosmopolitan distribution. But 5 million years ago, this genus too went extinct, 
leaving only the two extant species. So, what happened to the nautiloids? There were a number of competing hypotheses as to why the nautiloids went into decline such as climate change, but a 2022 meta-analysis seemingly identified the culprit. Whenever early pinnipeds, seals, sea lions, and walruses appeared in a given area, the nautiloids vanished shortly afterward. This seemed to indicate that the pinnipeds hunted the nautiloids to extinction across the world's oceans. Furthermore, the one region which still has nautiloids, the Indo-West Pacific, never hosted pinnipeds. But the nautiloids had faced predators before, including armored fish, giant marine reptiles, and even other marine mammals such as whales. So, why were the pinnipeds able to extirpate the nautiloids from any region that they co-inhabited? The authors of the analysis argued that it came down to their feeding strategy. Pinnipeds employ a method known as pierce feeding, where they use their canines to pierce the outer carapace of their prey's body, and then use a combination of sucking and thrashing to get it out of its shell. This can explain why pinnipeds have a preference for shelled prey when compared to whales. Ancient seals had skull features, indicating that they employed pierce feeding as well. On top of that, the seals could have held the nautiloids with their forelimbs, making it easier for them to bite off the cap shell and get at the soft parts when the nautiloid closed up. What's peculiar about the decline of the nautiloids is that in the 20 or so million years since they vanished from the global oceans, nothing has really evolved to take their place. And it's not like it would be hard for a number of animals to do so. For example, while living crustaceans live on the ocean bed, their larvae are free swimming, and as such, could have become neotenous, or retained juvenile features into adulthood, and in turn become nectonic. There are some animals who would be in an even better position to fill the niche left by the nautiloids. The quiqui is a catfish with thick dermal plates that could potentially become mineralized if it moved into a marine environment. Furthermore, the violet snail is a free-floating species of gastropod which secretes a mucus filled with bubbles to stay afloat. Yet, it didn't diversify into a large number of species with comparable mass and feeding styles to the nautiloids. I mean, okay, there's krill, but their shell isn't really thicker than fish scales. In evolution, there will always be trade-offs, and in the case of the shelled nectonic niche, it's protection for speed. I.e., if you have a shell, you're easier to catch, but harder to dispatch if you do get caught. However, it seems that the pierce feeding technique of pinnipeds was so effective at extracting prey that it nullified any kind of protective benefit a shell would give its owner. Now it just became a liability, since it made you easier to catch. This would not only have allowed the pinnipeds to locally hunt the nautiloids to extinction, but also make the role that they filled in their environment non-viable. Basically, nothing evolved to fill the niche left by the nautiloids because the niche itself no longer exists. Now, this wouldn't be the first time that a marine predator specialized to prey on shelled animals. During the Mesozoic, the shark Tychotus and the Mosasaur Globidans evolved flattened teeth to crush ammonite shells, yet ammonites thrived right up until the KT extinction event. So, these can be seen as part of the standard predator-prey evolutionary arms race. But at its base, evolution by natural selection is the non-random survival of randomly varying replicators, and it may be that the pinnipeds simply chance in a strategy which was far more effective than what came before it. Nature is, at the end of the day, very chaotic. Although there hasn't been much discussion about a novel evolutionary innovation eliminating a niche, the converse is plain to see. There are countless times that evolutionary innovations have opened up new niches, even ones unrelated to the niche the organism with said innovation fills. For example, the development of vascular tissue in plants facilitated the evolution of the first trees, which then started growing in forests. This then opened up all the niches seen in forests today. So, in that sense, it's not too difficult to envision the development of a new feeding strategy rendering a niche uninhabitable. A parallel which can be made here is the evolution of military technology. Technology is always advancing and developing newer, more effective pieces of equipment, be they vehicles or weapons. These will then replace older equipment until further developments render them obsolete and they get replaced as well. 
Generally, there is an expectation that when a piece of equipment is retired, whatever replaces it should do the same thing, only do it better. But sometimes it doesn't, and this can leave military enthusiasts very confused. If they're a big fan of whatever piece of equipment was retired, they'll assume that there was some kind of conspiracy, like Lockheed Martin paid off a top Pentagon official to retire Boeing's quote-unquote better aircraft to get them the contract. But what's often missed is that military technology doesn't evolve linearly. Advances in technology don't just lead to the development of better equipment for a given role. They change the rules of the game, and to make the most of the advances in military technology, doctrine has to change accordingly. War. War never changes. This often leads to the creation and elimination of entire roles on the battlefield, and what makes a piece of equipment optimal for the new role is a different set of criteria than the previous one. Here's one example. In the 80s and 90s, the M113, which acted as an armored personnel carrier, was replaced by the M2 Bradley, which isn't as fast and carries fewer troops. This would make the M113 the better APC. So why was it replaced by the Bradley? Simple. The Bradley isn't an APC, it's an infantry fighting vehicle, and it doesn't just transport troops, it gives them fire support on the battlefield, and with its 25mm autocannon and tow missile launchers, the Bradley is better suited for that role. In fact, a design feature once seen as an asset can become a liability. Take air-to-air -air combat. In the early and mid-20th century, what made a plane good at shooting down other airplanes was the ability to maneuver in a dogfight. But the development of fourth generation fighters brought radars which could shoot down enemy aircraft from beyond visual range, curtailing any advantage that agility gave you. Then, fifth generation fighters came along and brought stealth to the table. But an airplane has to have a specific geometry to be either maneuverable or stealthy, and putting an emphasis on one will compromise the other i.e. there's a trade-off. And now with the development of radar technology that allows a pilot to look in a direction to get a missile lock versus having to point the nose of the plane at the target, any advantage agility gives you is negated and it only comes at the cost of making the plane easier to detect. Much like the pierce feeding technique SEALs used negated any advantage a shell would give its prey and it only made it a liability because it made its owner easier to catch. I mentioned that Aturia was the only nautiloid to survive in the global oceans past 20 million years ago, and this genera had a thinner shell that made it faster than the other nautiloids, which can explain why it was able to persist longer than others in the presence of pinnipeds. Now there are plenty of other shelled animals in the ocean, but they live on the bottom where they can hide in the rocks. So are the last two species of nautiloids living on borrowed time? And will they also be driven to extinction should pinnipeds move into the tropical Indo-West Pacific? Well, not necessarily. Trends in ecology, even those which last millions of years, don't persist indefinitely. And should some environmental catastrophe wipe out the pinnipeds, their pierce feeding technique would go with it, and the shelled nectonic niche will become viable across the global oceans once more. And the remaining two nautiluses can radiate out into many species and fill the seas as before. So, I guess one key difference between the extinction of a species and the elimination of a niche is the latter can be reversible. Well, that's all I have to say on the topic, and if you have any contentions or something to add, please leave a reply. Thanks.